Chapter 17 Exiled Where were we? the luthier asked. Allows them to fully enjoy the music, something that, replied Richard, mimicking the luthier's exact words before Mr. Haito's arrival. The luthier smiled. Very good. Something that makes their world right. I see what you mean, Richard agreed. After thinking about Mr. Haito's angry face, Richard laughed. The luthier added with a gleam in his eye, It does feel good to give people what they need. The luthier then continued with their earlier conversation. Some believe that you cannot truly play a romantic song until you have loved, or make others mourn until you have suffered. The luthier's words struck a powerful chord inside Richard. Salty Pete's was a flat open field by the time Michelle's and Richard's verdicts were read in the courthouse. The Ferris wheel had lit up the entire night sky with its blazing lights and brilliant colors. It was the most beautiful thing that Richard and Michelle had ever seen. They couldn't believe that it was going to be torn down the next day and secretly wished that they could sit at the top and kiss for the very first time. They stood paralyzed and had remained perfectly still even after the police arrived. Even though they hadn't done any damage or tried to run, Judge Becker wanted to make an example out of them because of the pending lawsuits and all the previous warnings. What made matters far worse was that the town gossip, Mrs. Becker, was also the judge's wife. The judge declared, We have to set an example to keep this kind of blatant disrespect of the law from ever happening again. That gate was clearly marked, and they knew that there were still lawsuits pending from the last group that went in there. The judge glanced at Mrs. Becker. Also, he added in a condescending tone, it just isn't right for a boy and a girl their age to be out at that time of night. Richard and Michelle could see Mrs. Becker's lips move in unison with the judges, and smug glee was written all over her face as the judge handed down their verdicts. When it was over, their punishment was a restraining order placed upon both of them so they could not see each other unsupervised for six months. During that time, they each had to perform 150 hours of community service. Six months! Richard stood in the courtroom and screamed, Please, sir, no! Can I pay a fine instead? I will pay anything. He was thinking of his buffalo nickel collection. One year, the judge yelled, and we will not have any more outbreaks in this courtroom or I'll have you locked up. Michelle and Richard looked at each other in horror. When the paperwork was finished, they weren't even allowed to say goodbye. They simply looked across the room at each other while their parents finished signing the papers. Then they went to their separate homes. The amusement park didn't just change things, it destroyed things. Their parents acted as though the verdict was a relief. There were no fines to speak of, and they were hopeful that this would finally give Michelle and Richard a chance to find other friends. At the same time, Richard and Michelle didn't think the community service would be that bad when the judge announced it. After all, they had done those chores together just to see the happy looks on people's faces. But once they started working separately, it became miserable, painful drudgery. Richard had never felt so lonesome. Every time he bent over to pick weeds or help someone with a chore, it reminded him that Michelle was not there. After putting a handful of trash into the wheelbarrow, Richard thought, 
To be separated for a year is bad enough, but two whole months without even seeing her is unbearable. At George's suggestion, both sets of parents had agreed that it would be better if they were not allowed to see each other at all for two months to try and break them of their obsession with each other. They weren't even allowed to write notes or letters. Every weed that Michelle pulled became a physical struggle because she had no strength. She couldn't eat anything without choking, and when she finally got something down, more often than not, it came back up. She would almost pass out for lack of oxygen every time she ate, which finally did happen. Her mother had heard noises coming from the bathroom and ran as fast as she could, yet by the time she got there, Michelle was unconscious on the floor. Even though Margie cleared her throat and successfully administered mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, it was as though someone had taken a large syringe and sucked the life out of Michelle. Richard's parents tried taking him to concerts and getting him interested in other things, but the moment the judge had said, One year, Richard's life and dreams had fallen apart just like the small toys where the button is pushed in on the bottom and the stick figure on top collapses into a heap. Nothing mattered. Nothing tasted good. Nothing looked good. It may have been daytime outside, but to Richard, the sun wasn't shining. Even if it were, it couldn't get through, and when the night came, his mood became even darker. After a month had gone by, Richard finally managed to eavesdrop on a phone conversation between Margie and Elaine. Margie explained how Michelle came home every night after doing her service hours and sat on her bed, silently holding her little dog. She would cry into his fur and wipe her eyes with him until he was as wet as a mop. Dehydrated and exhausted, she would finally roll over, whimper, and shake until she fell asleep out of pure exhaustion. She never makes it through the night without screaming, but she still won't answer our questions, and none of us ever gets back to sleep. Her teachers tell us that she sleeps in class and just won't do the work. She's flunking school, Elaine. Margie finished by crying into the phone. So is Richard, Elaine replied. Elaine then told Margie how she and George couldn't even force Richard to play his violin anymore. In fact, he can't. She burst out crying. Elaine was referring to the cast on Richard's arm. She told Margie how they had gone for a walk together as a family to try and cheer him up and get some fresh air. Then how he had tripped off the edge of the sidewalk. He just fell for no reason. You know where it rises up along Elm Street? Yes, was the reply. Where it's about four feet high by the ditch? Right there, replied Elaine. He collapsed onto the street and rolled back into the gutter. We're lucky there weren't any cars driving by. The strangest thing was, he didn't even try to stop the fall. He just fell off, limp as a rag. Now he has a concussion and a broken arm on top of everything else. He just laid there as though he didn't feel a thing like it didn't matter at all. At the hospital, the doctor told us Richard was suffering from low blood pressure and that he had lost 20 pounds. I think we should take him to a psychiatrist, but George won't allow it. He says Richard will get over it. But I don't know, Margie. I'm scared. Do you think we should let them see each other? Margie asked. Richard's heart almost flew out of his chest, and he could feel the blood pumping in his ear against the receiver. 
He waited for the reply and began softly pleading, Please, God. George says not for another month. Maybe just before Christmas. He thinks by then they'll get over it. Or be dead, was Margie's reply. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, Elaine. I didn't mean that. Margie hung up. Richard quietly replaced the receiver and walked back to his room. He had thought about it. Sometimes he wasn't sure why he even kept breathing. But then he would think, this will end. It's only another month and I will be able to see her again. Richard hadn't seen Michelle's face since that awful day in the courtroom. Sometimes he tried gathering hope by counting days, but each day by itself was so long and dreary, and everything around him was so worthless and meaningless that his feeble attempts were always short-lived. He remembered the book, Where the Red Fern Grows, and how they had cried together while reading about Big Dan and Little Anne because she was always smarter but how Big Dan would always protect her if anything went wrong. Richard cried while thinking of little Anne crawling up on Big Dan's grave and dying of a broken heart. He closed the door of his bedroom and sank to the floor. He went into deep depression and rolled on his side in pain. The entire world bore down on his soul and he felt powerless. He rolled over to look at the pictures of he and Michelle hanging on the wall above his desk, and he groaned. He finally took his anger and tightened it into a fist. No, he screamed. I will not give up. In one more month, I will see her again. Richard pounded the floor as his desperation and despair gradually turned to resolve. Richard did see Michelle again. It was two days before Christmas. They were told exactly when and where they would meet two weeks before, in the hope of cheering them up, which, of course, it did. They were each to receive ten dollars to buy the other a Christmas present, since neither of them had any money. They would shop separately then be allowed to exchange gifts by the fountain in the center of the mall, because Michelle's parents were leaving for the holidays the next day. Think of something that she likes, but have a few alternate choices. Many of the stores sell out right before Christmas, Richard's parents had advised him. The morning after the announcement, Richard asked if he could make Michelle a special present as well as the one he would buy for her. Yes, of course, Elaine replied. I will just need some string, cardboard, tape, and glue, other than the paints and things I already have in my room. Richard kept his bedroom door closed with his desk against it the entire time. He worked on the present day and night and finished it the morning before they were scheduled to meet. Just in time, he thought, while making the last finishing touches. Then he ate his first full meal in over two months. Richard could barely contain himself that evening. He knew exactly what he was going to buy and held the $10 bill tightly in one hand and the large cardboard box in the other. Once they arrived at the mall, he headed straight toward the music store. He walked down the sheet music aisle and picked out Michelle's favorite songs. Even though some of them were old, the store had all of the ones he wanted. Maybe that's why they still have them, he thought, while looking at all the other empty shelves. George and Elaine seemed pleased with Richard's choice of presents. You will let her come over and play our piano again, won't you? Richard asked. Yes, of course, George replied. As long as one of us is home and we have time to watch you, until the rest of the year is over. Thank you, was Richard's sincere reply. He was the happiest he had been since the night at the Ferris wheel. 
George and Elaine smiled after seeing Richard's face light up. The previous two months had been a terrible drain on all of them. George asked, You are going to stay composed at the fountain and act reasonably, aren't you? Richard thought of the many discussions and lectures they had already had about this very subject. Yes, sir. I wouldn't do anything to spoil tonight. Good, son. It's about time. When the sales tax was added to the price of the music, Richard was 20 cents short. He started taking back one of the songs. That's all right, his father volunteered, handing the cashier another dollar. George took the change and the receipt, since Richard's hands were full. Richard headed straight for the fountain, with his parents trailing behind. They noticed a small jingling sound coming from inside the box and wondered what it could possibly be. Christmas was only two days away, and hundreds of people were frantically scouring the mall for their last-minute presents. Richard looked at every face, trying to see Michelle at the first possible moment. They waited for over an hour. When the lights began flickering off and many of the shops started locking their doors, Richard hung his head. I wonder what happened, Elaine asked. I don't know, George replied. I hope they didn't get in an accident or... Oh my gosh, Elaine let out a gasp. Her voice startled Richard and he lifted his head. There she was. It was Michelle, but Richard could barely recognize her. Her face was pale and her cheeks hollow. Her glazed, malnourished eyes were sunken with dark rings around them. She had always been thin, but she looked like she had lost half of her body weight. Her familiar clothes hung loosely from her emaciated body, and her elbows were larger than her arms and she had no hair. There were only small, ragged wisps of light brown, no more than a quarter of an inch long. Richard flinched and thought about the pictures of starving African children he had seen. They all looked good when compared with Michelle. He had lost almost as much weight as she had, but she was so much smaller to begin with. When he finally looked down from the tufts of hair and into her eyes, he realized that Michelle was still there, inside. They were both in tears by the time Richard stood up and said, Hi. Trying to act as though nothing was wrong, Michelle's father offered, We're sorry we're late. Even though we had an appointment with the jeweler, he was so backed up that we had to wait for over an hour, and Michelle wouldn't leave until it was finished. Michelle smiled and held up a small package with both hands. When Richard took it from her, their fingers touched for the first time in over two months. The feeling was more wonderful than he could have ever imagined, more wonderful than he had built up in his mind while sitting alone in his room. I feel I have to explain, Margie began. The night after we told Michelle about this meeting, I went to her bedroom to call her to dinner. When I walked in, she was sitting on her bed looking like this. Margie lightly brushed her fingers across the top of Michelle's head. She was holding it up in her hands and asked, Please sell my hair. I don't know if she read it in a book or heard stories somewhere, but there she sat, holding it out for me to take. She told me that $10 wasn't enough to buy the present she wanted to give Richard, and that she just knew her hair would make up the difference. It had to, she said. Margie began crying. I tried scolding her, but I just didn't have the heart. So I tried finding someone to sell it to. I looked for the people who make wigs, but our town is so small that I couldn't find anyone. I asked all the people we knew, but I couldn't find any place that bought hair. 
When I finally told her yesterday that no one would buy it, she collapsed. I didn't know what to do. Joe and I couldn't scrape together more than a few dollars to save our lives. Then Michelle begged me to ask Mr. Edwards. He'll know someone. So with nowhere else to turn, I took her hair over to him in a shoebox. When he saw it, he asked if it was Michelle's right away, then smiled and assured me that he would take care of it. He said he knew some people. When I told Michelle what Mr. Edwards had said, she cried, I knew he would know where to sell it. I just knew he would. He's my friend. Later that evening, he came over to our house. Michelle had been on the couch all afternoon waiting for him, and for the first time in months, she fell asleep smiling. I heard his cane on the sidewalk and answered the door as quietly as I could. Then he handed me the copper vase that Michelle had made, filled with more than a hundred dollars in one-dollar bills and loose change. The people I sold the hair to didn't have any larger bills, he explained. Margie smiled through her tears. So, here we are. Richard's eyes never left Michelle's. Thank you, he whispered. He looked at the small present and said, But you first. Together, she replied. Richard put the present in his shirt pocket, picked up the large cardboard box, and handed it to Michelle. She started to take it, but Richard noticed that her arms were shaking and a worried expression spread across her face. He knew that even though it wasn't very heavy, she wouldn't be able to hold it by herself. With Michelle still holding on tight, Richard slowly placed the present on the shelf behind the seat, circling the fountain. It was just below eye level. Michelle waited for Richard to retrieve his present from his pocket. Okay, now, they both announced together. Richard carefully unwrapped the package. It was a sterling silver rosin holder that he had seen in the music store on the other side of town. It had branches and leaves around the top and an engraving of Paganini on each side. One was a portrait and the other a finely engraved picture of Paganini playing for an audience. The lid was engraved with Maestro Richard in large fancy letters, while the bottom read, My Friend. When Richard opened it and looked inside, there was a buffalo nickel sitting on top of the rosin. Michelle had a hard time pulling the tape off of her present. The box Richard had made opened from the front like a small cabinet. Her mother bent down to help, but Michelle seemed determined to do it by herself. So everyone stood back and waited while she finally pulled it free. When the two halves swung open, both set of parents gasped. The Bergonzi and its bow were sitting on a stand meticulously made out of cardboard and painted with flowers and birds. The box was dark blue inside with two trees on the doors, one on each side. In the top of the box was Richard's entire buffalo nickel collection, hanging from thin dark blue threads. They looked like stars in the night sky. Above them were the words, Everything I am or ever will be, I give to my friend. And at the end was the watch his father had given him with the word forever painted over it in gold. Richard placed the sheet music on top of the box and smiled. Michelle smiled back. No words were necessary. The main lights turned off overhead, and George took a step forward. We'll talk about this. Then he closed the box and picked it up. Joe and Margie, still dazed, nodded in agreement. 
Each set of parents took their own child in their arms and headed for the exit. Richard with his silver rosin holder and Michelle with her music. <laughs> 